Hi, I'm Dr. Piers, and welcome to this video on standard deviation and standard error of the mean. So most of you have seen graphs like this before that have error bars representing either the standard deviation or standard error of the mean. These error bars are critically important in data representation, and so it's really important that we have an idea as to what they mean and how to interpret them. So let's start off by putting a few minds at ease and reminding you that you do not need to memorize the equations for standard deviation or standard error of the mean. And as an added bonus, you don't even have to use these to actually calculate values for either of these. You do, however, need to understand what they mean and how to interpret them in data sets. So the goal of this video is to show what standard deviation is, what it actually measures, what the standard error of the mean is and what it measures, but most importantly, connecting them both to the idea of how they can be useful in analyzing and interpreting data. So let's start with the standard deviation. The standard deviation calculates the dispersion or the scatter of the data set around the mean of that particular data set. So, Looking at the first set of data where the mean is represented by the green dot here in the middle, if all the data points are close to the mean, that data set will have a very, very low standard deviation. Whereas if the data points are scattered further from the mean, the data set is considered to have a large standard deviation. So it should be clear from this that the standard deviation is a measure of the variability within a sample or data set. A low standard deviation means that the data set has a low degree of variability, whereas a high standard deviation simply means that data has a high degree of variability. So why is this important? So consider this graph that shows the results of the time it took for Jack and Jill to run up the hill. They each ran the five times and the averages were plotted. And the conclusion would be pretty simple, that they pretty much take the same time to run up the hill. And that conclusion would be true based on the evidence. But the mean only shows one thing. And if you actually look at the data set, you can see that the data is quite variable for the two, uh, the two participants. So you really want to make sure that when you're graphing stuff, that you're honestly representing your data. And one way to do that is to plot the standard deviation. So when you do that, you can see instantly that there are differences between the two data sets despite the identical means. Jack clearly has a high variation in his data and Jill does not. So while we have a measure of the mean and the estimate of the variability in the data, we still don't really have a good idea as to whether or not our data is precise. That is, we really don't know if Jack's average of 100 seconds is truly representative of what we can expect from him. And that is where SEM comes in. So let's go back to Jack's data for a minute. Remember earlier when we took that uh, standard deviation of the single set of data. Now imagine if we repeated the experiment with Jack not once or twice, but a dozen times. And each time we calculated the average of those five trials. That is a lot of data. And now, in a move that has inception-like qualities, we are going to go to a deeper level and actually calculate the standard deviation of all those averages from Jack's different data sets. And this value is known as the standard error of the mean, which quantifies the precision of the mean. So another way to put that is, is that standard error of the mean is a measure of how far your sample mean is likely to be from the true mean of the population. So the lower the standard error of the mean is, the more likely it is that your calculated mean is close to the actual mean. So after all that, the calculated mean, uh, calculated standard error of the mean for this data set is about 6.33. The problem is, to maintain our energy, efficiency, and sanity, we don't do the experiment dozens of times. We usually only do it once. And this creates a bit of a dilemma for us when we want to calculate the standard error of the mean. Thankfully, statisticians have come up with a way to estimate the SEM without actually compromising the integrity of what it means. That brings us back to the earlier equation that we looked at. Using a single experiment that has n number of trials, 
You can estimate the SEM by dividing the standard deviation of the experiment by the square root of the sample size. In the case of Jack's original data of five runs, the standard deviation was 16, and thus our SEM is, estimate is 7.15, which actually isn't that shockingly far off from the 6.33 that was calculated using the data from the 12 experiments. So now that we know that the SD is a measure of the variability of a data set and the SEM is a measure of the precision of our data, how do we use this to actually interpret data? So before we answer that question, we need to remind ourselves about what a normal distribution looks like and how it relates to standard deviation. So if you look at a normal distribution of data like this, with the mean value right in the middle, it has been shown, and with the greatest respect to my statistician colleagues, I really don't know how this works and I don't really care that much, but it has been shown that 68% of the data points will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean, and a full 95% will fall within plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean. So how can we use these statistical estimations to actually glean information from standard deviation and standard error of the mean error bars? Grab a cup of coffee, it's time to focus. All right, let's go back to Jack's first set of data plotted with error bars representing plus or minus two standard deviations this time. From this graph, we can state that if he were to run up the hill 20 more times, we would expect that 19 or 95% of those times, that value, his time, would be between plus or minus two standard deviations from 100. In this case, 95% of the time, it would take him between 68 and 132 seconds. While true, that information isn't all that useful. The way we use SEM is slightly different. Now let's look at the same data, but this time the error bars represent plus or minus two standard errors of the mean. So remember that SEM is simply the standard deviation of the averages of repeated experiments and measures how precise the mean of the sample is compared to the true mean. So because we're dealing with standard deviation again, we can apply that same 95% rule to the SEM. So in this case, uh, we could say that if we were to repeat the entire experiment 20 times, we would expect that 19 times, or 95% of those experiments, would produce an average time that is between 86 and 114 seconds. Now, clearly, the smaller the SEM value, the narrow that range becomes and the more precise our data becomes. Uh, you might want to take a minute to digest that and perhaps watch that section again. So seeing as the standard error of the mean gives us an estimate of how precise our data is, how could we use the SEM error bars to compare different data sets? So let's have a look at some other data here. Here's a graph comparing the assessment scores for students who have watched instructional videos to those who have it. And yeah, that is a shameless plug. At first, there seems to be a benefit to watching these videos, and you probably could make that conclusion based on the evidence. But what happens if you calculate the SEM and plot error bars representing two standard errors of the mean? Would your conclusion be different? And what happens if you add a few samples to each population and replot the data? Well, now you can see that while the averages have not changed much, the SEM error bars have become a wee bit smaller. Does this change the conclusion at all? What happens if you double the number of samples in each population? Well, now the mean seems to have changed a bit, but again, the SEM error bars have gotten smaller yet again. So now what's your conclusion? When faced with graphs like these containing standard error of the mean error bars, there are a couple of guidelines regarding the overlapping nature of the bars that you can employ to help you interpret the data and make conclusions. So if the error bars overlap and the overlapping region includes the means of the sample, then there is strong evidence that there is no difference between the two populations. If the error bars overlap, and the overlapping region does not contain the means of the sample, 
there is really no strong evidence that the populations are either similar or that they are different. Not really much can be concluded here because the uncertainty is just too high. If the error bars do not overlap at all, then there is strong evidence that there is a difference between the two populations. So there you have it, a relatively quick guide as to what SD and SEM are and how to interpret them and why you would want to include them in your own data represented as error bars. So hopefully after this video, you won't feel the need to watch it two more times just to confirm anything. Thanks for watching.